This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. When we were children, many of us dreamed about becoming explorers. Robert Ballard's lifetime of exploration started with his love of the ocean. He would become an oceanographer, helping advance science, like discovering hydrothermal vents or hot springs where seawater meets magma in the deep sea. Yet Ballard had a pipe dream to find Titanic, and he did. The discovery catapulted his career, but he didn't stop there. He writes in his memoir, Discovering Titanic was an experience of a lifetime and an accomplishment that I'm proud of, to be sure, but there's so much more to my story. Today where we live, Ballard, a Connecticut resident, joins us to talk about his life and what he learned about himself. And what's his next adventure? He writes about all of this in his new book, Into the Deep. Now, did you grow up watching Dr. Ballard's National Geographic specials? Or did you see his reports from his research vessel, Evie Nautilus, while a school student? Robert Ballard joins us on Zoom from New London. Bob, welcome to the show. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me. Yes, it's uh, nice to have the book out on the street. <laughs> It was very interesting. I couldn't put it down. And it's such a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, So many of our listeners know your name and know about your adventures. But I wanted to start at the beginning, uh, Bob. If you could tell us how you uh, were drawn to studying oceanography. Well, you know, as I say in the book, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers come from. But uh, (laughs) I was born six months after Pearl Harbor, and my father packed up the family, and off we went, and we arrived in California. And I remember as a little kid, you know, having been in the cornfields of Kansas, to go down and gaze out at this big blue marble. I mean, it was just, can you imagine having never seen the ocean before? and then staring out an endless horizon of an ocean that covers a third of the earth. And it just mesmerized me. I lived close to it. Uh, Back then they would say, you know, I I had a bicycle. They'd say, just be home before it's dark. And off I'd go to the tidal pools. Mm -hmm. And I began exploring as soon as I could walk. And the ocean was always the magnet. We love speaking to scientists on the show. We know that we have a budding uh, scientist who may be listening. Uh, Lena tweeted that her eight-year-old will definitely be tuning in. He's absolutely obsessed with the Titanic. But before we get to the Titanic, can you talk about um, you know, how you broke into the field? Well, again, here I am in, living in California in San Diego, and we uh, we're in a, a new development called Claremont up above the hills of Mission Beach, California. And the guy across the street's daughter had a horse. And I always wanted a horse. And so I was always hanging out over there trying to get a free ride. Well, it turns out that he worked at Scripps, the largest oceanographic institution in the world. And he would take me on field trips down to see, you know, the, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Uh, And so it began early right nearby was the submarine base, uh, World War II submarines. My parents took me there. And and it really, for me, galvanized when I saw them. I'm dyslexic, so I tend to look at things more than read. And uh, I saw the movie 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And it just captivated my imagination. And I uh, sat down, you know, how parents will always say, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would say, I want to be Captain Nemo. And they didn't laugh. Now, I'm sure they went into the other room, said, Houston, we have a problem. But they they worked with me on it. They took this passion. You should never stomp on a child's passion, even if it's a little silly. And they worked with me. They said, well, tell me more about Captain Nemo. I said, I had a submarine called the Nautilus. So they took me down right nearby, saw my first submarine. And as you know, I went into the Navy and specialized in deep diving submarines for 30 odd years. So that part of the, uh, the of the passion was there. But then they said, but the Nautilus was more than a submarine. I said, yeah, it had windows. They opened like the iris of a lens. And they said, that sounds like an oceanographer. So they took me down to Scripps where I'd already been. And I met the people there. And, and then um, we later moved back to up to Los Angeles when my father was head of the Minuteman missile program. Uh, but I continued my correspondence with Scripps in high school, and I won a scholarship 
the summer of 1959. I was 17 years old and I went on my first adventure at sea. <laughs> we got rescued by the Coast Guard. I thought it was cool, but you know, I was too young to worry about drowning. And, and we got rescued by the Coast Guard and it just continued uh, more and more and more. And, and I haven't stopped since. Was that the same trip where you had uh, caught on to some sailor's language at the dinner table, Bob? <laughs> yeah, that, that was, you know, uh, yes. Uh, we, after being rescued by the Coast Guard, the ship had been completely decimated by the storm. And we were way up off Northern California, off, uh, off Humboldt County, off. And they uh, brought us in and they said, well, we got to fix the ship. So why don't you head home? And, and then they sent me on another adventure in the deserts of Mexico. But I went home and my mom, this was my first big time away from home. And, and, uh, and she had a big party. My grandmother, you know, the local neighbors wanted to hear about this great adventure of being rescued because of the newspaper and all that. And I said, pass the something, mother. <laughs> <laughs> And there was a little still, my, my, my mom said, well, he's certainly turning into a sailor, isn't he? And so uh, I, yeah, I, I, normally I would get my mouth washed out with soap, but that night I got to eat my dinner. <laughs> you know, it's been quite a year and a half. I'm wondering how you have weathered the pandemic, Bob. Well, you know, we've been very fortunate. Number one, it gave me a lot of time to write the book. <laughs> I haven't been at sea now over a year. But I'm sitting right now, if we were going on a Zoom session, I'm sitting in a command center at, in my office in New London. And we call it the looking glass because another favorite fantasy was Alice in Wonderland when she stepped through the looking glass and and to Oz. And, and my, I can literally do everything that you need to do right where I'm sitting this very second. Uh, we've moved away from moving your body to the bottom of the ocean. You know, the book talks about my 20 years in deep diving submarines, but then how we've transitioned away from moving your body to moving your spirit. And it's very much like the movie Avatar, where they put the guy, Jake, into the Navi and uh, moved his spirit into another thing. And that's where we're headed. We're headed now to autonomous vehicle systems. Um, but all through the book, you'll see the technology constantly changing, changing, changing. And because we have now what we call telepresence, and we've had it online for quite some time, it doesn't matter where your body is. So the scientists don't have to be on the ship. In fact, we're moving to teleoperations where we'll eventually have ships with no human beings on them at all. They're already existing. Uh, I work a lot, 30 years in the Navy, in the development of autonomous systems. And they're now, we have a ship that's a, a, a submarine hunting ship called Sea Hunter that has no human beings on it. So as a result, we, we haven't, we're, we're at sea. Uh, we're seeing uh, right now, we're coming in to pick up some stuff, but uh, we really weathered the storm quite nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, relying on autonomous uh, vehicles and, and cameras, but you've also talked about in your book what it's like to be in one of those manned submersibles. For many of us who will never be uh, that deep in the ocean, can you describe it for us? Well, we call them human-occupied vehicles now, HOVs. Uh, <laughs> And the ships are uncrewed ships. So yes, uh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's really interesting because uh, I'm not claustrophobic, but uh, even if I were slightly claustrophobic, which you certainly can be at 20,000 feet when something goes wrong, you have a window. And so, yeah, I'm inside, Alvin's sphere is, was six feet, is six feet in diameter and I'm six two, so I couldn't even stand up. They stuffed three people in there. It was like going inside a Swiss watch. And when we got out of the submarine, they had to untie our legs. But I, I spent a lot of time. It's sort of a Zen kind of thing, sort of a, uh, a you know, I sit in cross-legged looking out of a window and you just go inside yourself um, and look out the window. But now I've moved the window and I have a much better window because I have 12 camera systems in my vehicles underwater. So, but it, yeah, it's, uh, it's more, it's, it's really, uh, you don't feel when you're falling, when you're free falling in the submarine, it's not even like an elevator. You don't feel any sense of motion. 
and you look out the window and uh, and since the marine snow the creatures that die in the sunlit zone the euphotic zone and their bodies falling down you're you're going a little faster than them so it's like a reverse snow the snow looks like it's snowing from bottom up as you go down uh, but that's the only sense of motion uh, and if you don't look out the window it's just time in the elevator uh, mm -hmm. you you lose all light that you can use for your eyes at around a, a thousand feet depending upon clarity of the water so when you're making a 20,000 foot dive 19,000 feet of it is total dark and and you're just in the elevator we play music i love john denver's rocky mountain high because <laughs> he was a friend of mine and also i was diving on mountain ranges by going down to them so i needed to get into it and i would play rocky mountain high in my submarine and the acoustics were beautiful mm -hmm. You know, reading your book, you've had uh, quite a life for the people that you've met, the adventures that you've gone on. But a lot of people think of you as uh, just the man who found Titanic. Is that one of the reasons yeah, well, why you wanted yeah, to write you, the book? Well, you know, as the, as the as opening part of the book is my mom. Yeah. It begins when, you know, I found the Titanic and came back and was totally surprised by the world's reaction and went on every talk show you can imagine, the Today Show, the Tomorrow Show, the Tonight Show, the show we haven't <laughs> thought of yet show, and went on this National Geographic Media Blitz, uh, really sent me almost into shock, and I come home and the phone rings and it's my mom. Now, I'm the first of 13 generations of Ballards in America to graduate from college. And so I went on to get my PhD as did my brother Ed, and was the first in our family to go that far in the academic process. And so my mom said, you know, we saw you on the, all the talk shows and all the neighbors are calling, but it's too bad you found that rusty old boat. And I went, mom, are you okay? I'm perfectly fine, son. She's a wonderful lady from Kansas, common sense and said, you know, you've done a lot of seminal research. You're a tenured academic professor at prestigious program at Woods Hole with link to MIT. And you've done wonderful science. And now they're only going to remember you for that rusty old boat. And moms are always right. I know my obituary will be the man who found the Titanic died today. Earlier, you mentioned that you're dyslexic. Can you talk about how you, you got that diagnosis, uh, you know, just diagnosis just recently? And when you look back, how uh, the fact that you were dyslexic helped you make these kinds of discoveries? That was interesting. You know, I, I had trouble reading, uh, uh, you know, and that's the code. But 1940, I was born in 1942. The word I don't even know if dyslexia existed as a word. And when I struggled reading, my mom said, oh, you miss phonics when we moved. My father in aerospace industry, moved, we moved a fair amount. And she said, well, you just missed uh, uh, phonics. So, so I, and we'll get you a tutor. So I would get up every morning at six o'clock and go to a tutor on my way to elementary school. And I, I began to learn how to memorize words. Uh, I didn't have spell check. Oh my gosh, do I love spell check. Uh, I, what's really awful is one spell check says, I have no idea what you're trying to spell. <laughs> so I learned, learned a lot of anonyms and synonyms, but uh, I didn't realize that I had dyslexia. I just knew it took me longer. So I just took more time. I spent a lot of time uh, uh, studying because I, I read slow. And then I would take my notes after I got back from class and I still have them. Cool. I have amazing archives. And I would type my notes up so I could read them again. I couldn't read my handwriting unless I did it right away. And then I would memorize the sheets of paper. And then when I took an exam, I almost felt like it was cheating because I just closed my eyes and read the pages. And there was the answer. So uh, I, I, I got through. I got life membership in the California uh, Academic uh, Scholarship in uh, high school. And quadruple majored in, in college uh, in math, physics, chemistry, and geology. Uh, so I just battled through it. Uh, and so it wasn't really until my daughter was diagnosed, you know, living in Connecticut, you know, the Yale, the epicenter with Sally Shawitz and her husband Bennett, uh, the, the seminal research in dyslexia. And they diagnosed my daughter. And fortunately, we had teachers who 
were well aware of dyslexic kids and were very accommodating for my daughter. But then I was driving to my inner space center over at the Graduate School of Oceanography at URI, where I'm a professor, and I was listening to NPR. And there was an interview by two authors named Brock and Fernetti Ide, E I D E who had just published a book called The Dyslexic Advantage. And I'd never heard dyslexia and advantage in the same sentence. So I came home, ordered it, uh, went online, ordered it and, and got it as fast as I could, read through the night, read through the night and tears running down my face because it was the first time it explained me to me. And I went, oh, my God, I'm not alone. There's a lot of us. There's 15 to 20 percent of the global population. And, and I felt like I wasn't alone. And I realized what, it gives you a pathway. Go down this field. Don't go down that road. It was like a roadmap to success. And what I discovered is most dyslexics are outside the box. Uh, the vast majority of billionaires and millionaires are dyslexic and uh, self entrepreneurs, uh, and I've always lived out of the box, and I have found I'm very comfortable out there. Most people aren't. So I, I just pursued a career fortuitously that really is cool for dyslexics. We can kick the bejeaners out of non-dyslexic. I work in a world of total darkness, not me. I close my eyes and I see the whole thing. So it just worked for me. And I, 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 really want to spend the rest of my life helping other dyslexics because if you look at the the list of dyslexics they're commonly men although a lot of my daughter lots of women as well but if you look at the ones that that are noted for success uh, walt disney uh, uh picasso leonardo da vinci uh in modern terms ted turner uh charles schwab uh, Steven Spielberg, it's mostly white men. And when you look at the prison population, it's mostly non-white people of color and the vast majority of them are dyslexic. So I'm committed to helping people of all persuasions, every flavor you can imagine to, to understand you have a gift. And so that's my new cause. Robert Ballard is my guest today here on Where We Live. He's a Connecticut resident and explorer known worldwide for discovering shipwrecks like Titanic and the Nazi warship Bismarck. Today we're talking with him about his memoir, Into the Deep. We'll continue talking right after the break, and you can join us too or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Dr. Robert Ballard has been part of 157 expeditions, discovering ancient ships and artifacts that he's shared with the world through dozens of magazine articles, films, and TV specials. A high point in his life was discovering Titanic off Newfoundland in 1985. But in his new book, Into the Deep, Ballard says his life's accomplishments go beyond finding Titanic. Now, Bob, I, I believe this Wednesday Day is 36 years since you first found Titanic. Tell us about that moment when you saw her. I forget. Yeah, I know it's <laughs> it is coming up, isn't it? Well, you know, as you'll discover in the book, uh, it was not my primary mission. I was uh, served in the United States Navy for 30 years and most of it in naval intelligence. And I did things for the Navy. Worked a lot with the NR1 based in uh, New London on a lot of different missions. And uh, I was actually asked by my commanding officer at the time, uh, Admiral Ron Thunman, who was Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Submarine Warfare, who we used to call Op 2 to conduct a series of top secret missions. And, uh, and one of them was to explore two submarines we lost during the Cold War. Uh, we lost the USS Thresher, and we lost the USS Scorpion. And ironically, the Titanic was lost between them, or you wouldn't be talking to me today. <laughs> and so when I was called into his office, and they, and they could some rug time on the E-ring 
in the Pentagon, he told me about what he wanted me to do and I got my orders. But I suggested maybe we could have a cover for this. And he said, That's, what a cockamamie idea, Commander. He went off and did his Rick over thing all over me. Uh, but what he didn't know was the Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, had taken it to President Reagan and President Reagan had already approved the hunting for the Titanic as a cover for doing the operation uh, to Thresher and Scorpion. So the Admiral certain soon learned that his chief, <laughs> his boss said, we're going to do it. So when, so now I'm on a top secret mission. Uh, I do the Scorpion. I have all these uh, three Navy people embedded in my team that people aren't aware that they're Naval intelligence officers and off I go. And so when we found the Titanic, I was, my concern was blowing my cover and that they would figure out what I was really up to. But the world went so nuts over the Titanic, it was not a problem at all because all they wanted to hear about was the Titanic. And so I, I, I dodged the bullet. So yeah, I was nervous, but then, you know, it, it was down to the final four days when we found it. And so we, cause we spent most of our time on the Scorpion mapping it and figuring out what the, you know, it lost nuclear weapons and on the list went on that one. Uh, and we were able to finish our mission for the Navy. So, but we only had 12 days. We spent most of it finding the Titanic. So we only had four days left when it happened. And so naturally having played college basketball and scoring the winning goal at the buzzer, when we scored the winning goal at the buzzer, we all jumped up and down. We were very good, like children, you know, as jumping crazy, uh, <laughs> celebrating and all of that. It was really non-scientific. Uh, and, and someone, looked at the clock and innocently said, she sinks in 20 minutes. We, it was It was 2.20 and she sank at, 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 at 2.40. Uh, and the sobering feeling, we felt embarrassed that we were sell, dancing on someone's grave, and which we were. So we just, I just said, hold it, bring the vehicles to a safe altitude, let's get outside and let's catch our breath. And we had a memorial service on the aft deck and the moods changed. So it was like a wall switch from winning the game to going to uh, a gravesite. And so it was quite a, all those emotions coming down on me, it was quite a, quite a, quite an emotional uh, roller coaster ride that night. You would go back, I believe, in 1986, and you were very outspoken uh, to the world that the artifacts aboard Titanic should be left undisturbed. What happened? Well, you know, not the way I wanted it to happen. I went to court. I went to the court uh, to ask them about maritime law. And they said, well, the Titanic was... Uh, lost in the high seas and its owner collected the insurance from its insurance company and then the insurance company wrote it off as a loss which officially made it an abandoned shipwreck so under admiralty law of the 17th century because we were on no territory here they said uh, you can own it uh, if you go back which we were doing we were going back the following year and pick up a, just an object, a cup. Because nothing down there says Titanic, even the name on the bow is gone. Uh, just pick up a cup that says White Star Line and bring it to the court and I'll officially make you the salver of possession was the terminology. Under the, but you can only do that if you then salvage it. You have to remove it from the bottom of the ocean. I said, it was exactly not what I do not want to do. You do not go to Gettysburg with a shovel. Mm -hmm. You don't take belt buckles off the Pearl Har off the uh, uh, the uh, Arizona and Pearl Harbor. This is a grave, and we saw where the bodies landed. We saw their, their their remains. Now their bodies were eaten and their bones dissolved, but. Their shoes, there were pairs of shoes everywhere. A, mo a mother's shoe next to baby's shoes, and you're going to pick up her wallet? Not a chance. So we, we, I said, I'm not going to do it. And they said, well, then you can't be salver of possession. And so some, I don't want to go down the road of who did it, but someone from Connecticut uh, 
went out and hired the French to go do it, and they began salvaging it, and I've been completely opposed to it because there's nothing to learn. The, the Titanic had a, two sister ships. Uh, they were building three of these, the Titanic, the Olympic, which preceded Titanic, and the Gigantic, which they renamed the Britannic and used it as a hospital ship during the Battle of Gallipoli, and it sank off of, off of Greece. So when they, the surviving ship, the Olympic, when they finally brought it offline, they meticulously sold off everything. The smoking, uh, the, the first class smoking room, the lounge, all the dishes, everything mm. that you can go online and buy that all the stuff that was on the Titanic that wasn't on the Titanic is identical. So what are you going to learn? Bring up a cup and say, yeah, I've got 12 on the shelf over here. Why do I need that cup? So I said, you know, yes, I've done archaeology where I've worked with, with classical archaeologists and, 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 and I'm a non-recovery person. I'd rather go down there and visit it. But in some cases, an archaeologist will say we need at least a few objects on that under their supervision will recover. But I'm anti-recovery because I'm all about telepresence. I'm all about the future of uh, the largest museum on earth is beneath the sea. There's more history in the deep sea than all the museums of the world combined. And it's perfectly fine down there. So as soon as you bring it up, you destabilize it. And why not just visit it in situ? Mm. Let's talk about the other history that you've uncovered, the Bismarck. Tell us about that. That was actually tougher than the Titanic because I remember I was, uh, the book, they published my book on the Titanic, and I was at the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is an annual event of book publishers. And there was another guy sitting next to me, Baron von Mühlenheim Reichberg, who was the senior surviving officer from the Bismarck. And I'm half German, half English, so I'm sort of schizophrenic. But I, being a naval officer, I was well aware of the Bismarck. And so I got into a conversation with him about his book he was publishing on the Bismarck. And I said, so where is it? He said, I have no idea. Talk to the British. They sank us. So I began doing research on where it was, and it was a running sea battle. And when you're in a running sea battle, you're not writing down uh, latitude and longitude. You're writing down range and bearing. So the search area was vast, bigger than the Titanic. And it was in a deeper water, 16,000 feet. Titanic was 12. And it was... Uh, on the in a complex terrain so it was a tougher job but uh and we failed the first time got it the second time we always fail the first time like amelia we're going back uh, do, do not lose track we're going after amelia on round two uh none of these mountains we climb should be easy to climb uh, tell us when you saw bismarck i believe your son todd was with you uh, as you write in he the was. book when you saw the, the swastika on the ship, what was that like? Well, it was shocking because it wasn't <laughs> supposed to be there. We'd done all our research. And, you know, when the Bismarck was, it was its maiden voyage as well. Like, if you can survive your maiden voyage, you're good after that. But anyway, the, the uh, Bismarck, when it was in, in German waters, had painted swastikas fore and aft on the aft deck and, 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 and stern. And so that they wouldn't get attacked by their own people because no one knew much about the Bismarck, even the Germans. And so they painted it over. But then, uh, when they left, they just they said, well, we'll paint over the swastikas. So the swastikas had been painted over. So we didn't. Exp but when it, it sank so a few days later that the paint came off. And I'll never forget coming over the bow and we see the swastika. And I had a graduate student with me sitting right at my side next to Todd was Hagen Schimm, who was a German graduate student. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, why did they paint a cross on the Bismarck? And I turned to Hagen and I said, Hagen, that's a swastika. And that was pretty shocking, both that he thought it was a cross and, and that it was there. Yes. Uh, what, was it, yeah. what was it like to share that discovery uh, with your son, Todd, who was there? Well, it was a part of coming to manhood. He was about to turn 21, but he didn't make it. 
And for our our listeners uh, who read your book, you detail that um, he died in a car crash uh, after uh, that trip with you. And you make a point uh, to to say when you lose a child, you never recover. And as a parent, I was... um, I'm so sad to hear about his untimely death, but you also talk about the importance of visiting other couples when you learn they have lost a child because someone did that for you. Yeah. Um, some two angels showed up. I don't know who they were. And uh, yeah, this is not easy to talk about, but yeah, it's, I'm the first there. I also had to do casualty calls during the Vietnam War and go to the mother. Yes, it's tough. Mm. But something that helped you, as you write in your book, uh, you were listening to Bill Moyer's interviews with Joseph Campbell about the power of myth and how we are all on these journeys and this constant act of becoming. and. You know, it's really powerful to hear uh, these these words, read these words coming from you uh, as someone that we, you know, we've all seen and heard from these amazing adventures. But you are open and talking about your vulnerabilities. And so I thank you for sharing that with us, Bob. Well, we all are on these, this journey. We, we arrive. We don't know where we came from. We don't know where we're going, but we know we're here. And, and I love Joseph Campbell's uh, book and his interview with Bill Moyer. It really helped me a lot because I was pretty questioning, as you can imagine, about the whole ball game. And life is the act of becoming. You never arrive. It's, it's, an, it's from beginning to end. You're, you'll be becoming the moment you take your last breath. My guest today is Robert Ballard, a deep sea explorer, author of Into the Deep, a memoir from the man who found Titanic. We heard him mention Amelia Earhart just a little bit ago. We're going to hear more from him after the break about his next adventure. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. My guest today is Robert Ballard, a deep sea explorer, author of Into the Deep, a memoir from the man who found Titanic. Uh, next year, I believe you're going, or maybe in a couple of years, actually, you're going to be going back out to find Amelia Earhart. Tell us about uh, the, the first time you tried. Well, I like you. Uh, I like your comment when I go out and find Amelia Earhart. That's <laughs> That's the plan. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, there, there, were, there's, there were three theories on what happened to Amelia, and we only have a few seconds to go. But one was that she was captured by the Japanese and died in a concentration camp. Well, I can't do much about that one. The other one was that she, uh, uh, her destination was Howland Island, where she was going to refuel for her final hop to Hawaii and on home, and uh, that she missed the island. And she ran searching and searching and ran out of gas and then sank near Highland Highland Island in somewhere around 15,000 feet of water. And the third one was that she she, uh, knew their navigator. Uh, We forget there was a person aboard, Noonan was aboard. And we we know that Highland Island and Baker Island are on what's called a hot spot like Hawaii. There's uh, where the uh, plates are moving over a, a storm in the earth and they punch out islands. All the Hawaiian islands are in a straight line and all these islands were in a straight line going over another hot spot. So they knew on their navigational map that there were a line of islands and they actually picked the bearing and reported they were on that bearing. And the fact that they reported they were on that bearing down that chain of islands meant uh, to us they were hunting for the another they knew there was islands and their highest probability was to stay on that bearing. And right on that bearing was an island at the time called Gardner Island, it's now called Nicomarora. And there's a com- amazing uh, uh, piece of data uh, suggesting that she landed on Highland Island and died on Highland Island. So National Geographic, who's the sponsor of it, said, let's go for that one first because it was less expensive, less, less difficult to, to go on an island and off an island than it is to hunt in the middle of nowhere in 15,000 feet of water. So we, we did a massive hunt. You can go to Disney Plus. It's on there right now. It was one of my best documented failures. 
<laughs> but it was really an amazing story because it also told the story of Miller. So go watch it on Disney Plus and then read about it in my book. So now we're 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 done with Nick and Aurora <laughs> and we're off to Howland. And so we're gonna go there with a pack of wolves, which is using lots of autonomous vehicles. So uh, we'll get it. When we think about uh, climate change, uh, you spent so much of your career uh, on the ocean, uh, in the ocean. Uh, what do you want our listeners uh, to, to take in terms of your perspective on climate and our role as humans? Well, just expect a lot more devastating hurricanes and tornadoes. It's not only the rise of the ocean that's coming up okay. as we as we now thaw out the permafrost in the northern latitudes of, of, of Russia and Canada, you're opening a millions and millions of, 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 of refrigerators and all their organics are rotting. It's the methane that's coming out right now is the game changer, much worse than CO2. So it's going to melt. Uh, I think most people, the genie's out of the bottle and we're going to see sea level come up. Uh, but it's also the energizing of the atmosphere, and that's what you're seeing with these tornadoes and, uh, and hurricanes. Uh, the velocities, the intensities, yes, this is uh, new, uh, our new life. And we, we, we know that there was, an, there was a natural rise of sea level in, in an inner glacier, but we've accelerated it through human activity. So the prognosis is not good. See, I believe in the concept of Gaia, and that is a is a uh, where, where where science are looking at the Earth as an organism, and in, and codependent upon life on the planet. So there's a synergistic relationship between life and Earth, a codependency on one another, and there's one species that's off the reservation, and it's us, and they're gonna win. The earth will be here fine for billions of years. There will be life on earth for billions of years. The question is, does the human race survive this century? And unless we clean up our act, we will not. So this is the war that's broken out and we need to make, make peace with it. And we need to really change our ways or we're gonna be gone. When you open up your memoir, Into the Deep, uh, there is a map of all of the places where you've had expeditions. Can I ask you in just a, a few minutes we have left, what's the part of the world that you still hope uh, to explore? Oh, the Indian Ocean, uh, the Western Pacific, where we're headed with my ship. I do have a ship. I didn't get to mention it, Nautilus. The Nautilus naturally had named it the Nautilus. It's 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 come into port right now to pick up some vehicles. We have to go pick up some vehicles we dropped the other day uh, off Canada. But we'll be spending the next five years exploring America's exclusive economic zone. America owns more land than any other nation beneath the sea. It's fifty percent of America lies beneath the sea before global change, and we have better maps of Mars than half the United States of America. So I am so excited about forward deploying and living over in the Central and Western Pacific where a lot of America is located, exploring our, our country and doing the second Lewis and Clark expedition, although we don't call it that because 55% of our core of exploration are women in positions of leadership and authority. So I call it the Lewis and Clark expedition, <laughs> but I also want to get into the Indian Ocean uh, that's where the coelacanths were found, and that's another story. You know, in your book, a critic uh, called you an underwater cowboy. Is that a term you embrace today? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled. My dad was a cowboy. My fam family, my grandfather was shot in a gunfight tragically, and my uncle was Bat Masterson. So being a cow called a cowboy, thank you very much. <laughs>
<laughs> it has been a pleasure to hear from you this hour here on Where We Live. Robert Ballard, again, he's lived in Connecticut for uh, some time now. Uh, we 30 know years. That. 30 years, and it's so great to hear from you again. Uh, you lead Ocean Exploration Trust that's headquartered in New London. Uh, you can still go online and learn all about Nautilus, um, and we'll make sure we share a link uh, with our listeners at Where We Live. Robert Ballard, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. NautilusLive.org. Thank you. Again, his memoir, Into the Deep, a memoir from the man who found Titanic. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, today's show produced by Tess Terrible. Cat Pastor is our technical producer. We hope you are with us as well. <laughs>